thank you again for hearing our prayers this morning. And Father, as we come and look at this last um, portion of Scripture as we're closing out this series, if you're willing, we just pray that God the Holy Spirit will just have his way in all that's said and done. And Father, we just pray that um, you would just speak to us as individuals. We really want to hear from you as individuals, Lord, and we really want to go home having heard a word from you. So I pray for us specifically, Father, that there will be clarity, there will be understanding, that you would open up our hearts and minds, that you would confirm by your spirit, and that you would challenge us also to go home and study and check and see if these things are true as well. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll use uh, this sermon today for whatever you would like to use it for, for the audience who is here right now, and for the audience who may hear this later online or through CD. So, Lord, we commit our time to you. We thank you that you're more than able. And so we are trusting you to do just what you want to do today for your glory and honor. We acknowledge this is all about you, and we pray that it will be presented in that way, that you get the glory and honor. Your name is uh, spread. Your fame is spread. And um, that's what it's all about, Lord. So grant us to um, uh, um, cooperate and align up under that and allow you to have your way. In Christ's name we pray with much thanks, Lord, for your faithfulness. Amen. I said you were God's part three. Going over some things, and like I said, you bear with me. You might have this piece, but maybe your neighbor doesn't have it. As we're going over some things today, and I said you are God's part three, the first thing that we want to say is this. The God of the Bible is an uncreated spirit. The God of the Bible is an uncreated spirit who's in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? So the God of the Bible is an uncreated spirit who is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We want to look at some scriptures this morning, so we're going to be doing a little bit of reading. So we're going to look at Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, and we're going to read that together out loud. Join me now. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. An uncreated spirit who is from everlasting to everlasting. Another way of saying that is God is eternal. Here's another way to break that down. God has no beginning and no end. This is who we're talking about, an uncreated spirit. Okay, did you get that? Say amen if you got that. Okay, you got that? Okay, so he is a person um, who, excuse me, an uncreated spirit who is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, and it's talking about one person, and it's showing these three persons of this one person. Let's read this out loud together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. So, an uncreated spirit who is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is eternal, no beginning and no end. The God of the Bible has many names to describe him. Why? Because the God of the Bible has names that describe who he is and his character and his heart, okay? And so, his most significant name in the Old Testament is Yahweh. And Yahweh basically means the self-existent one. Yahweh means the self-existent one. We're now going to go to Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Let's read it loud together. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham. So the God of the Bible has many names, but his most significant name, again, is what? Yahweh, okay? And that means self-existent one. The self-existent one, Yahweh, the triune God, stay with me, stay with me, he created other spiritual beings before the earth ever was created. Yahweh created other spiritual beings before the earth was ever created. We're going to read Job chapter 38 now verses 1 through 7, okay? Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. What we're getting from this text is there were other created beings before the earth was created. So if you remember this, this is a time where God comes and speaks to Job, and he kind of is giving him a tune up, like, where were you when I did all of this? You're so smart, you know everything. Where were you at, okay? There's some people that sing. There's some people, maybe I shouldn't say people, let me even be more precise today. There are some personages that are seeing, singing, there's some personages who are seeing all this, they are, un, they are created spiritual beings who were here 
watching the earth be created. Okay, you still with me? All right, so bear with me. This is what we're looking at here. Let's read it together. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know, or who stretched the line on it? On what were the bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The morning stars there and the sons of God, these are the other created spiritual beings that were there when the earth was created. They were here before the earth was. We tend to call the name of these spiritual beings angels. And so I got into that last week and I went home and did some more study on it. And so I told you that the word angel means messenger and there are different levels of angels, okay? And so I wanna try to be more precise today and, and even clean up some things there. Today it's gonna be okay to call them angels if that's what we need to communicate because I found so many scriptures where Paul says we are gonna judge angels later on and he's talking about the divine counsel. He's not talking about messengers. So I had to go home and learn some more and study some more and agonize over some scriptures and read a whole bunch of scriptures that we translate angels. So angels does mean messenger, but angels are created spiritual beings. Stay with me, stay with me. And there are ki all kinds of levels of these created spiritual beings. Did you get me? All types of levels of these created spiritual beings, but we tend to group them and just say they're angels. Yeah and no, but we're gonna to try to be precise. And if we get this, we'll get it. There are different levels of angels based on their responsibilities. There are different levels of these spiritual beings who were created based on their responsibilities. And in this whole chain of responsibility, the spiritual being who brings you a message is really still kind of on the lower end of the totem pole compared to a spiritual being who's standing there guarding over a whole country. Do you see it? The one guarding over the whole country has more responsibility than the one who's speaking a message. So these created beings were there when the earth was created. We tend to call them angels. We're gonna be as precise as we can. They're created beings, created spiritual beings today. But there are different ranks of these spiritual beings. Also, these spiritual beings, as I said, have varied responsibilities. So what we wanna do now is we wanna look at some of the names of these created spiritual beings. We're gonna look at what some of them are called. So we're gonna go back to Psalm 82, we looked at this last week, but we talked about some spiritual beings. Here's a new name for some spiritual beings we looked at last week. Let's read this together. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? So we looked at that last week. We're going to just comment on it in a few moments. But over there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we get some more names of these created spiritual beings. They do some different things. So we're going to look at Ephesians 6, 12 now. Pay close attention. Read it together with me. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. These are some of their names. We had divine counsel, a group of divine counsel, a group of God's cabinet over there in Psalm 82. We had that also translated there in Psalm 82, gods. Remember, we talked about that last week. And so then we have, over in Ephesians 6, we have rulers, powers, and the spiritual forces. We talked about this last week, but stay with me here. I just want to make sure I can clear some things up if there's a little bit of, of confusion here. When we studied Psalm 82, we taught us that the word translated God is what? Elohim. 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 Now, all spiritual beings are Elohim. All spiritual beings are Elohim. So when your Bible talks about um, the divine counsel, the word is Elohim. When the Bible talks about um, uh, rulers and powers, oftentimes it'll be something along those lines, they will be Elohim. But let me define Elohim from the Old Testament because that's where we're focused. Elohim in the Old Testament means any spiritual being, okay? Any spiritual being, any 
personage that does not have a body, okay, is an Elohim. The only time a human being becomes an Elohim is after they die, okay? And we talked about that last week. Samuel comes up from the dead. The Bible says he is an Elohim. Elohim is translated God in English, okay? So we have um, Yahweh, he is an Elohim, an uncreated spiritual being, but no Elohim is Yahweh. Okay, did you get that? Yahweh is an Elohim, but no Elohim is Yahweh, and there are many Elohims, but only one Elohim who is Yahweh. What separates him? He is uncreated. The rest of these spiritual beings are created spiritual beings. I made a mistake last week. I used that word disembodied too much. Disembodied means in most cases you had to have had a body. In some cases you didn't have to have a body, but disembodied, I think, brings confusion. So we're talking about spiritual beings who don't have a body. They are translated Elohim, even demons in your Bibles, Elohim, they're Elohim. One day you will be, but today, like we mentioned Robert, we mentioned Tom in the day, we mentioned Ronnie and Vicki Fox, they are Elohim now. They are Elohim, just like Samuel. They are Elohim. They are Elohim. So that's a word that's used for human beings. The only time Elohim is used is after they die. So we go on now. We're talking about these created spiritual beings. I hope I haven't lost you. We've talked about a lot of this, but I'm trying to get it and simplify it. So then there are some other created beings, and these created beings have a different title, and they're called sons of God sons of God. They're different, okay? They're different. Their job description is different than an angel. Their job description is different than, uh, might not be, it could be, but it's not always the same as the divine counsel, okay? So we have sons of God. So we're going to turn now to Job 1.6, and we're going to look at some created beings who are called sons of God. Let's read this together. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Okay, so these are sons of God. You know we're so tempted to say the angels, aren't we? Don't you want to just say angels? Uh, well, you can say it, I guess. But they're these created beings, and they're coming to show up to God. It's time to have a little meeting time. And another guy from the outside, who used to be the top guy, who got demoted, so to speak, shows up with them. And you know the story, the rest of the story of Job, right? Yeah, surely, you, surely he praises you. Look how you treat him and stuff. Let me put some fire in his life. Let me bring some heat. Let's see if he praises you then. And so the whole book of Job is really about that. So what we're looking at now is the fact that these created beings are called the sons of God. The sons of God show up to this meeting in the heavenlies, okay? Let's go over to a verse that we studied last week, Deuteronomy 32.8. Deuteronomy 32.8, we discussed this in the context of God giving these Elohim authority over nations. And so this was what we were looking at. Let's read this together. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. Okay, so he divided mankind up. You go there, you go there, you're going to be over those, you're going to be over those. And he did that according to the people, and he did it according to the number of the Elohim that he had operating that day. But they are called, in this context, sons of God. I gave you a definition last week I got from a Q&A companion to a book called The Unseen Realm. The author's name is Douglas Van Dorn, and here's a definition I want to quote because this is really important. Sons of God, this is really important, stay with me. Sons of God is a term of high rank in God's spiritual hierarchy. It denotes administration, task of greater significance like territorial rulership. That's what we're dealing with, decision making. Um, status in the divine council, those are the personages that in the unseen realm that are called sons of God. Sons of God have other names. We look in the scriptures. Sons of God are also called watchers over in Daniel chapter 4 verse 13. The sons of God are also called the hosts of heaven. You ever see those scriptures where God is saying you're worshiping the host of heaven? 
you're always thinking it's stars. Well, there's a little bit of that too. But there were some personages that they were worshiping called the hosts of heaven. And they are, other places are called sons of God. In 1 Kings 22, 19 through 21, we're talking about hosts of heaven. And then, of course, we've looked at Psalm 82, verses 1 and 6. We've looked at that already. The divine council is also called the sons of God. There are other passages on the sons of God. Sometimes they're called glorious ones, and then sometimes it's singular, like archangel, okay? That's a son of God as well. And as we get into it later, just to help you rejoice and make sure you don't feel left out, when you come into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a son of God. And boy, I hope you understand it's much more than you're thinking it is right now. It's much more than you're thinking it is right now, and it's something to get happy about, because the good sons of God are one day going to replace the bad sons of God. And I'll let that one simmer. You might have to take that one home and figure out if you got what I just said. I'm excited about what I'm doing. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I'm excited about it. So um, let's go on. Sunday school works like this. I don't really know what it's about. I don't really know. It doesn't matter who teaches. But it has this uncanny way that the Sunday school teacher, no matter what they are, they do something that I've already had written, and you know, we're gonna do a double-double. We do it every Sunday, whether you notice it or not. So the people who come to Sunday school kinda get a double dose, and so the people who don't, they still get something anyway, so it's all good. I'm gonna say some things that are already in my notes, which were already written, um, but you heard some of it this morning, okay? So you heard a little bit of it this morning, so just, just bear with me there. So we're introduced to one of these created spiritual beings. We're introduced to one of them in Genesis chapter 3, okay? This particular created spiritual being is called a cherubim. And a cherubim is one who literally guards the throne of God. So boy, when we're talking about created spiritual beings, when you get to go to the top, you get to go to the cherubim level because you get to guard God's throne. You get to guard Yahweh's throne. And there's all these other created beings and they're doing all that and they're going and taking messages and they're doing all these other things and guarding countries, but you get to stay. Your job is to guard Yahweh. This is the, this is the top position of all. In Genesis chapter three, that wasn't good enough. He's called the serpent in Genesis chapter three. And what he did was he successfully got mankind to operate independent of God. Here's the goal. It's always going to be the goal. It's been the goal. It's the goal at present, and it's going to always be the goal. He wants you to leave God out, and he's going to do everything he can in your life to get you to leave God out. And that's what Sunday School was so rich about this morning that as Tony Evans brought that out, you forgot about the cosmic warfare. Satan is trying to destroy your marriage because your marriage is a reflection of God and a representative of God. And Satan is trying to turn your kids against you for the very same reasons. And he got into all the depth of it before we even say I do because marriage is God's idea. It exalts him. It reflects him. And he wants to destroy that because if he can destroy marriage, he's got a good foot, foothold in the war that's going on between he and God. So in Genesis chapter 3, it was illustrated, right? It was illustrated. And so he got mankind to operate independently of God. His name was Lucifer, son of the morning. Oh, talk about rank, you know. We know him as Satan. Satan means adversary. We know him as the devil. The devil means slanderer. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, calls him the God, small g, of this world. He wants to run things. He wants to rule things. He's got, you know, that's the goal. That's always been the goal. And if you're falling asleep, wake up. He works hard at what he's doing. The snow ain't going to stop him. The weather's not going to change his mind. Oh, he's, he gets knocked down, he's going to get back up. He doesn't care if it's Veterans Day, whoever's day it is. He never takes a day off. He wants to be God. He wants to replace God. He is going to fight God all the way to the end. He's going to do whatever he can to dismantle your relationship with God. 
because he's already read the book. He knows the book better than you do. There's a thing in here. We'll get into it later. He and his folks are going to be cast into the lake of fire. He knows that's the truth. He knows that's for certain. He knows there's no repentance. God is not going to change his mind. God did not send anybody to die for his sins. It's locked in. And so he's not taking any breaks. He's not going to ease up on you. He doesn't care about you. And so in Genesis chapter 3, we're introduced to him, and he works hard at what he's doing. He works hard at it. And then over in Genesis 6, if it can be said, it gets a little worse because we learn after the fall in Genesis 3, things got worse because created beings did something that God dealt with immediately. They crossed a boundary that God said, you better not ever cross and what happened here in Genesis 6, oh, it was bad in Genesis 3. You got that, right? You got Adam and Eve. That was bad, right? The fall of man. There's something that happened here in Genesis 6 where a boundary was crossed that Yahweh says, we don't do that. And what it was was these created spiritual beings looked at these created physical beings, females specifically, and said, I want one of those. And so they cohabitated with these physical beings, and that is crossing the line because God keeps those created spiritual beings and the created physical beings separate in that area. Are you seeing that? And so they hooked up there, and so they decided, we're going to go ahead, plan this thing out. We are going to cross Yahweh by crossing the spiritual physical boundary in this area. And that was very, very serious. They had relations with human women. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4 teaches that God, didn't wait on this one, didn't send a memo, cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. End of quote. Second Peter 2, 4 says they were cast into a place called Tartarus, waiting for judgment. There's no getting out. There's no bail bondsman. There's nothing like that. They are there. God dealt with these created spiritual beings quickly and permanently right then. There were other created spiritual beings not doing what God wanted them to do, but they're still running around. But when God saw that, he dealt with those who were a part of that thing and dealt with them immediately. That was a boundary. God said, I will not tolerate that. I won't work with that. We're not going to work that together for good to a certain extent. You guys are going down now. Shortly after that, God flooded the earth as well. We get Genesis chapter 9. Everybody gets to get a fresh start. The created spiritual beings get to get a fresh start, and the created physical beings get to start fresh. God says, be fruitful, multiply, and to mess with you a little bit, and even told Noah, and you guys can start eating meat now, at least legally. Okay, you can even start eating meat now. Diet change and everything. Just, just be thankful for the food. You don't have to be vegetarians anymore. So in Genesis 10, when everybody should have been happy, we're talking about the created spiritual beings and the created physical beings. It just wasn't that. Just be fruitful and multiply. You know, God, and spread. Why multiply? Be fruitful. Spread God's fame. Move around. Spread who God is. Tell people who God is and how he operates. Spread it all over the world. That's what God wanted them to do. Enjoy yourself. Just take God with you wherever you go. Enjoy yourself. It should have been good for everybody, but you know that's not how it goes. In Genesis 10, instead of doing what God said in being fruitful and multiplying, the physical created beings said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. And literally, if you read your Bible, go home and check it today. It says, we want to make a name for ourselves. Forget Yahweh spreading his fame. We want to make a name for ourselves. And let's build something that'll show that we're making a name for ourselves. We're going to keep a name for ourselves. And check this out. And we're going to keep our name in one place. We ain't going nowhere. So they build this tower that's saying we're not spreading out. They build this tower. It ain't about God. It's about us. And we want to stay in one place. So God, you know, makes a little visit. And so he makes this visit and he creates something new. You may have heard of it. Different languages. 
different languages. And he creates something new, different languages. And you know what? Somehow, when you can't speak the same language, you move and find your own place. You spread out anyway. Okay, so God's will is being done anyway. And then when you can't speak the same language, you got all your money invested in your time and your labor, you got to give up on your construction projects. Can't build a house, can't build a car, can't build anything if you can't speak the same language. Are you going to take too long to build what you're trying to build? Because you can't do it all by yourself, one brick at a time. And so construction had to stop, and then they had to move. So what we talked about last week, stay with me now. This is where some of you got confused. Let Ron, God, help me simplify this and keep this straight. Something else happened then. If, I can, if you allow me to illustrate, God said, you know what? I'm kind of tired of the rebellion, the stiff-neckedness. No matter what you do, these folks are rebellious. And so he says, let's have a council meeting. I'd like to do something. It's just temporary, but I'd like to do something. You're my good counsel. You're my good created spiritual beings. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to put you over these nations for a while. You be God to them, and they'll be your people. And I'm going to take a break from the nations for a while. I'm going to take a break. So you be over them. You be Elohim to them. You be God with a little g. And I told you this way. This is one of the things I like to say. God basically said, and you be good gods to them. And I'm going to work on some other projects I've got going. So God allows these divine counsel, these created spiritual beings, the authority and the privilege and the honor and the responsibility of being over these nations that are listed there in Genesis chapter 10. And that's some of the things that we were reading about. And God comes up with something else. I'd like to see if I could do something different. Maybe I could have a people that are all mine, only to myself. And I think I'll do that. Matter of fact, I'm going to start with this one guy, Abram. And so God calls on Abram. And so that's what we see there as we look at that there in Genesis. There to be good gods, and God says, I got something else I want to do. I want to call on this guy named Abram. Abram's name would be changed to Abraham, father of nations. And he, you remember, he and Sarah couldn't even have children. So this particular people group that God is creating, he did everything. You know, it wasn't about... Sexual relations didn't matter. They couldn't have any children. He did all of it for them. He put it together. They were miraculous. And so they become Abraham. His people will be called Jews. The word Jews means praise. You know, I'm hoping I can get some praise out of these people. I've had, you know, I'm working with the people over here. I basically had to do a Romans 1. Give them over to what they want because they don't want me. You know, but I'll come back. But let me work over here and see if I can get something going. I'm going to create these people. Jews means praise. And another word for them is Israelites or sons of Israel. So a good portion, stay with me, stay with me. This is very important. A good portion of your whole Old Testament, your whole Old Testament is basically the retelling of the battles and conflicts between these created spiritual beings and Yahweh and the people that these created spiritual beings are over, and Yahweh's people. The whole Old Testament is basically about that. There's a battle of the gods going on, but the battle shows itself through the people who worship the gods. And in case you didn't get it, and I left it out, these guys over here liked being little gods. They decided we don't want to be a good, good father. We don't want to be a good, good God. We like, we're going to do some other stuff here. We're really a little jealous of these human beings anyway. Where does he really get off making them sons of God like us? One other expressed that in the Garden of Eden. No way are we going to be sharing. Uh, so you're going to be like us? You see what I'm saying? So we've got that going on. So they decide, no, we're not going to do what God said. So they become these wicked and evil, if you allow me the term, gods to the people. So then we get Psalm 82. And what happened in Psalm 82? God calls a council meeting. And he calls them and he says, what's up with this? 
you guys are wicked. You're treating the people bad. I love, I love the fatherless. I love the widows. You're disrespecting them. Anybody that's doing good, you're just punishing them. And the wicked people, you're rewarding. That's not what a good God would do. That's not what I would do. You guys are going to be punished. You're going to die like mere men. I was afraid to say it last week. I didn't say it because I was afraid to say it. But this is this. I got to get my big peanut head around this one. What does that look like when God takes away your ability to be immortal? What does that look like? What does that look like? And so he told him, you're going to die like mere men. So that's what's been going on. There's, there's this battle, and there's going to be battles in the future. These, re, these spiritual beings are going to be punished, but they have not yet been punished like those who crossed the boundary earlier in Genesis 6. These spiritual beings are still doing their thing. We're talking about, look at our culture, how it goes against God. Look at our region of the country, how it goes against God. It's bigger than just you and I getting up one morning, eating our Wheaties and saying, we want to change things. We want some social justice. It's much bigger than that, folks. It is a war going on in the spiritual realm, and if you look closely, everything that's going on is going into this direction. Do whatever you want to do. Be whoever you want to be. Have, your, have it your own way. There's only one restriction. Just leave God out. And be specific, preacher. Be specific, preacher. Just leave Yahweh out. Just leave Jesus Christ out. Just leave God, the Holy Spirit, out. And you can do whatever you want to do down here. You can do whatever you want to do, and people are going to clap. They're going to pay you. They're going to reward you. Folks, do you see? It's bigger than just us getting up choosing. There's a war going on here. There's a war going on. So your whole Old Testament is about this. That's what the battles are about. That's what it's all about, God doing what he needs to do. And the enemies of God, more than just Satan, folks, more than just Satan. Genesis 6 happened after Genesis 3. Genesis 9, 10, and 12, 11, and 12 happened after Genesis 6. Are you seeing? So that's what's going on. Personages can make choices. And just like you're sitting here today, you can make choices to serve God or fight against him. To gather, Jesus said, or to scatter. To be part of the solution or part of the problem. We get to choose. That can be dangerous. And if you're not in secure in who you are like Yahweh is, that can be a risk you don't want to take. Amen? That's why, stay with me, you and I try to be so controlling. Ouch, come on now. Ouch. That's why we try to be so controlling. We're not like God. We don't want people making too many choices. We don't want people getting in our Kool-Aid. We don't want people being able to do something that we don't want them to do. We don't want to let people be risk takers because we live under the illusion that we're in control and we're not. We're not. So these rebellious spirits in the future, these gods with a G-O-D-S small, we studied in Psalm 82, they're going to die like men. All I can say is, wow, exclamation point, wow, exclamation point, wow, exclamation point. That's hard to get your mind around. So we also know that Satan and his followers, they're going to end up in a place called the lake of fire. We know that from reading Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, and he understands He's locked into his destiny. So that's why he works so hard to destroy the lives of anybody who believes in God. The spiritual sons of God are locked into their choices for eternity. But listen to this. God did something different. God did something different for these human beings. Listen to this. And he has a desire. He has a desire. There's some choice involved. But he has a desire I want them, the created ones, the physical ones, the human beings, I want them to have my name. I want them to be called sons of God. 
And ladies, this isn't a gender thing. This is talking about rank, authority, all of that. We're talking about he wants male and female human beings to come join his family. And when they start talking about rank and what people do, he says, those are sons of God, the human sons of God. He wants us to become sons of God in what we'd call a family way. So he sent his unique, one-of-a-kind son, the Lord Jesus, to fix our terrible situation. Just for a penny more on the side, get over there and get right back. Jesus is God's begotten son. And what begotten son means one and unique. There is no one else like that one. That's what it means. And so Jesus, when you talk about son of God, you can't even put him in the rest of the place with the rest of us because he is the unique son of God, the uncreated son of God. There is no one else like him. And so God sent Jesus Christ, his son, okay, to fix our terrible situation. God sent the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, in human form, and he became man. As a man, you know it. You know, you know um, Philippians 2. He humbled himself even further, died the death on a cross. He died for our sins. He died for my sins. He died for your sins, not for his own sins, not for the sins of some created spiritual being. He died for our sins. And why? So we could be made savable. So we would have the option to make a choice. Do I want to be a son of God or not? That's what Jesus put in place for us. He made us savable. He sends us what's called good news, the gospel. You've heard it. I paid the price is what he's saying. Why? So you could be reconciled to God. So you could go back and get under Yahweh, the true God. You don't have to stay over in all this foolishness. I paid the price. You can get free. All you got to do is walk out the door. I told you the story of the man in one of the Arab countries last week was a terrorist. They had, had him trying to get money. They had hit him in the head so many times with machine guns. He didn't know what his name was. Jesus told him, you're going to be getting out of here. The next day, they were fighting and shooting each other. He got up, opened the door, and walked out and hailed a cab and went home. I told you that. Remember that story? Oh, stay with me. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Jesus Christ has opened the door, held you a cab, and what we're talking about is you can come back home again and be in relationship with Yahweh. You can go where you belong. God was saying to you, welcome home, son of God. Welcome home. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection accomplished that. Uh, you know I'm convinced. You know it. You've heard it too many times. I don't believe we really understand all that the gospel did for us. This is a whole nother level of what the gospel did for us. It took you out from all of this stuff, got you out. No, you don't have to be anybody's victim, whether they are physically created or spiritually created. Jesus set you free. Come on home. He's saying, I had this in my mind all along, Yahweh said. I was going to go back and get mine anyway. I created you all for my glory. You're my children. I'm not going to let somebody keep you forever. They're just babysitting, and turns out they're going to be bad babysitters. Yeah, we hollering about that, but come on, let's get another ouch. And some of us know we are bad children with the babysitter. And I know I'm sure it was one of them. Amen? So he sends good news. I paid the price. Be reconciled to the true God. Be reconciled to Yahweh, the only one in his class. You got to get that. You're saying, oh, I'm reading my Old Testament wrong. Wait a minute. It says there's one God. It's comparative. There is nobody in Yahweh's class, so there's no other God but him. Remember, there are many Elohim, but there is Yahweh. There is no Elohim like him. He's in a class all by himself. He is the one Elohim when we're talking like that. Okay? So God is saying, you can come home. Jesus said, I paid the price, so you can come home. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to serve false gods anymore. You don't have to fear separation from the one true God anymore. You never have to fear separation from Yahweh again once you accept his son through the gospel. You'll never be separated from him. And remember, you know it by heart. Romans 8 says, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, all this stuff over here will never separate you from God once you get in this family. He said, I'm not doing that no more. 
We ain't hiring out no more babysitters. I'm raising me up a new group of sons of God. Is anybody hearing this on the right level? You know, I'm not too Pentecostal, but you might want to get up and do something if you're understanding what I'm saying here. This is the time to dance. Jesus is saying, I got a gift for you, myself. Yahweh's saying, come on back home, prodigal. I've been looking for you. I'm still looking for you. Come on back home. I love you. I have provided for you. That's what Yahweh's saying. Accept my gift. Okay, and listen to the gift. The gift is relationship, number one. Listen to this. The gift is citizenship. You're seated in the heavenly places in him already. The gift is ambassadorship. You represent me in a temporary stay down there on that planet right now. Home is up here where I am. You have an ambassadorship on, at home. That's part of your gift. Believe the gospel. It's good news. It's good news. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again for our sins. That is the gospel. That is the ticket for everyone to get back where God wants you to be. That's the ticket, the gospel. You gotta punch the ticket. You gotta believe the gospel. Gotta believe the gospel. Are you saved today? I didn't ask you, are you, are you at church? Do you go to church? Are you saved today? If not, let's get saved today. We'll share with you how. We'll stay here all day. Let's get saved today. And then for those of us who are saved, and I'm closing, I'm closing, don't forget you're in a war every moment. Do you understand the created, the created spiritual beings are warring against you, and they're using people around you. You have to understand the one who had the high rank, who guarded the actual glory, guarded God, guarded Yahweh, he knows he's at the top of the food chain. He's against you as well. He's not going to give up on destroying your life. He's against you as well. you got to remember, I have to remember, who are we fighting? Ephesians 6 says there's ranks of them that we're fighting. But there are ranks of, of them that we're fighting. we got to remember as Christians, don't forget you're in a war every day. Oh, a lot of this stuff is not accident. It is not coincident. It is not something where you, you get up and you're getting ready to preach like last Sunday and you can't move your arm. Can't even move your arm. You're sick. Can't even move your arm. That was last Sunday. Is it a coincidence? If I was going out to go hit the bars and chase the ladies and watch some porn, I think my arms would probably work, right? But when we get ready to do something for the Lord, it's time for body parts to shut down and time for minds to go and time to get in a conflict with somebody in your family, somebody in the church, whatever. Do you think that's just coincidence? My wife will tell you, I told her on Wednesday night, I got up last Sunday and couldn't move my arm. And I served communion and all that with no arm working. My theology says if you're weak, God owes you more strength. So I start laughing. Oh, it must be going to be good today because I can't use my arm. God, I have more weakness to present to you, so now I'm presenting to you this weakness so that you can be my strength. Had no problem. We did communion. We went on. We went on about our life. I told them Wednesday after the fact. The only person who knew my arm didn't work was my wife. Is it a coincidence? Oh, things happen. Please don't think that, you know, I, you get sick. You get sick. Things stop working. I get it. You turn over on the wrong side of bed. I get it. But I want to ask you, have you ever noticed it always seems to happen when you're trying to do something right, do something good, share something that maybe someone needs to hear. But when you're trying to get out here and you doing what the created spiritual beings are saying do and what Lucifer would want you to do, the deceiver, the liar, do you ever notice you don't have any problem getting there? Did you ever have any problem not going out to party or club because it snowed? And some of us grew up in a situation you didn't even have a car, you had to walk. But we got four-wheel drives with maximum tires and a little bit of water, and we got to stay home. How many of you called this morning to ask if we had canceled church? Don't raise your hands. You know you did. You know you did. Yeah, why are we, are we canceling church today? There was a little moisture in the air. I love my people. You know, I'm, I love my sheep, but they know I know them. I know us, right? We're like that. But when they call us to go out, we following them, we out there. We not only go out once, we go home, change our clothes, and go out again. 
And I'm not even talking about the intimate stuff that happens two or three times in an evening. Come on now. Come on now. Nobody was born saved in here. <laughs> but when it comes to the things of God, a little bit of do you. Baby, it's cold outside. We can't go to church today. You're in a war every moment. I'm talking to those of you who know God. And it's going on in the heavens, and everything that's going on in the heavens is affecting you down here. It's the war of the gods. It's not neutral. You're not neutral. No, you're, no, no, it's affecting you and I, okay? The gods are in conflict, and the unsaved, they're in conflict with God's own. The commander-in-chief is the triune God. You, you say that to yourself. Write that down, okay? And so, as we think about the triune God, I close this way. Wow. God the Son is your life. He's your life. And he wants to live out his life through you as you. God the Holy Spirit is the one who produces the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He lives in you. He wants to produce that. He tells you what's on God's mind. He will share that with you. That's what the Spirit does. No one knows the mind of the person except the spirit of the person. The spirit knows Yahweh's mind, and he's wanting to share that with us. The spirit is our power source, gives us the power to do this Christian life. You see what I'm saying? The spirit is our anointing. It's God, the Holy Spirit. And then the Bible goes on further. And did you know this, that God, the Father, works in you, both to give you the will to do what he wants you to do and then turns around and does it through you. This is what we have on the table from our commander-in-chief, the triune God. This is what we have. We've got to appropriate this. We've got to appropriate this. So we close now with just a little bit more about the three of them, the one of them, the one who is three, the three and one. Our commander-in-chief, the triune God. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 and these are things that are to bring us together in unity. And we want to read those, and let's read those in closing out loud, okay? There's one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Saints, we close today. We close the series that I know of, be loyal to the one true God. Be loyal to him. That's what he's looking for. Be loyal to Yahweh. Let the triune God be your savior, your Lord, and your life. Because the bottom line is, when you read this, you win no matter what. No matter where you are in history, no matter what happens to you, you die today, you win today, you're a winner because of all God has here. You win no matter what. Let's close in prayer. Father, we want to um, just thank you again for your word. And Father, today was try to get it clearer, try to get it down there, try to bring it another way so that people could grasp some things. Go, hmm, let me look at that. And so, Father, we trust that your spirit did that. We want to just thank you for all that we have in Christ. Thank you for coming after us. And um, thank you for all that you did. Help us to really understand what we're really dealing with, Lord, that these created spiritual beings who are rebelling against you are still alive and active. They are still called by names. They are still Elohim, small g-o-d-s, and they're trying to do everything they can to disrupt, to, to, to steal, kill, and destroy, and to fight against you. So please help us, Lord, to stay awake, pay attention, and really get to know you in the word and get to know who we are and who you are in us so that we can wage battle in a way that's really pleasing to you and really glorify you and be all that you would have us to be. So thank you for everything. And we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will continue to bring these things to mind, continue to challenge our thinking. We know that the enemy is just waiting for the final amen to snatch the word of God from us, to get our mind totally on something else, and to help us walk out. And then two weeks when I say divine counsel, somebody's going to say, you know, I never heard of that. And they're sitting right here right now. 
And so, Father, it happens. So help us to fight. Help us to do our part to hold on to the Word of God. Write it down. Look at it again. Help us to do our part. And so, Father, thank you for everything. Thank you for your kindness, your graciousness, your love, your patience. Thank you for wanting us, Lord. We are sons and daughters of God that are wanted by you. And so we thank you for that. You are a good, good father. In Christ's name we pray, amen.